All right, let's calculate the curvature tensor for the sphere of radius r. This uh, discussion will really challenge your ability to visualize shapes and angles in three dimensions. It might be challenging, but, but it's worth it. After all, this is an undercover course in differential geometry. So visualizing things in 3D is a very great skill to have. And I'm not saying this is easy, but this is the sort of thing you can very much become good at. Uh, I'm not particularly good at it, but I keep, I keep practicing it. So this discussion will very much revolve around vectors rotating at a constant rate because we'll imagine that angles are, well, the angle is our independent variable. So it's a good kinematic picture to have is that some things go around the sphere at a constant rate and makes a full resolute, it makes a full revolution in two pi units. And we already had this sort of discussion, it was in the play, not in three dimensions. When we're figuring out the, covari the covariant basis for the Euclidean space with respect to polar coordinates, where we talked about rotating vectors, and this discussion will be will very much parallel that discussion. So it's not a bad idea to review that discussion before watching this lecture. Okay, so here we have a picture of the sphere of radius r. It is referred to two angles, theta and phi. Theta is the north-south angle coming from the North Pole. So I have it drawn here. So I drew the corresponding coordinate line, which we can call a parallel. These are lines of constant theta. The lines of constant phi you may call meridians. So that's the east-west sort of thing. And we imagine that phi changes from west to east. So it goes from New York, from Philadelphia to Europe to Siberia, to Japan, and goes around the world that way. Okay, so of course nothing depends on phi, so I listed it here, but there's complete, complete symmetry with respect to phi, so nothing really depends on it. What else do we know? So let's talk about the covariant basis first. So if you imagine the, um, if you imagine the position vector, you almost don't have to imagine it because we're talking about the rates of change in the position vector. But when we keep phi constant and change theta, it's moving south. So as the position vector moving south, its rate of change will of course lie in the tangent space and point straight down. Because what we really have in the position vector, assuming this is the origin, is something rotating this way. So it's a vector of length r simply rotating this way, and it covers half the circle in half the time. It covers half the circle in pi units. It covers half the circle in pi units. So if it were length 1, its derivative would be a vector of length 1 pointing in the normal direction to the position vector itself. But because its length is r, its derivative is also length r. So S1, the corresponding basis vector, is a vector that points in the direction perpendicular to the radius, to the radial direction. It points south, because theta is zero here and pi here at the south pole, it points south, and its length is r. So, in constructing the covariant basis, we'll also of course need the metric tensor. So we're, con we're computing both now. We really have no choice but to represent it by matrix. It's not a bad representation. And what we just figured out is that S1 is length R, capital R, so it's a sphere of length R. Okay. So the first entry, S11, is that basis vector dotted with itself, so it's R squared. Okay, so now we have established S1. Now let's think about S2. Is it much trickier? I don't think. I don't think so. It's not much trickier. So here, the coordinate line is the parallel, the corresponding parallel. It's a circle. And of course it's a circle of this radius. And this radius, this segment, from this triangle right here, is R, which is this length, 
times sine theta. So that's the circle of co corresponding to the parallel that corresponds to the angle theta. Its radius, it's a circle of radius r sine theta. And now if you imagine this being the origin for the position vector, we well once again just have a vector rotating around, making one full revolution in two pi units. That's precisely the sort of change that we talked about before. So its derivative will be a vector that's perpendicular to this radius at all points. So it points strictly east-west, west-east. It points east. <laughs> so it, it lies in the plane of the circle, and it points east at all points. So if you think about it, S1 always points stri strictly south, down. Wherever you go down the meridian, that's where S1 points. And S2 at all points, at all points, points directly east. So these two vectors are actually orthogonal. So I didn't draw S2 here because it points perhaps straight into the board, so there was nothing to draw. So I moved it here. But of course it's a set, it's a pair of vectors like this. This being S1 and this being S2. So they're orthogonal to each other. So now I actually have all entries of the metric tensor. Because these two vectors are orthogonal to each other, these two entries are zero. And recall the length of this is r sine theta, so this entry right here is r squared sine squared theta. Alright, so now we understand our basis and understand our metric tensor. And we can even sneak in the contravariant uh, the contravariant metric tensor, which is the matrix inverse of this one. So of course it's r to the power of minus 2, and r to the power of minus 2, sine to the power of minus 2 of theta. And these two entries are zeros. Okay, one last thing, might as well mention the area element. Let's put it here. It's the square root of this determinant. And of course, it's r squared sine theta. A very familiar property because the determinant of the, a very familiar quantity because the, the determinant of this matrix is r to the fourth sine squared theta, taking the square root, realizing that sine theta is always a positive quantity, so this very beautiful, well-known expression. Okay, we're done with the metric tensor. Now let's turn our attention to the normal vector, which of course does the same sort of thing. One, element, one aspect of it is a little trickier. So here's the normal. It's a unit normal. So you will notice that I picked the exterior normal. When, you have, when you're dealing with a surface that's closed, it gives you an opportunity to specify the normal in a more precise way. If it's an open patch, it doesn't have inside and outside. But when the surface is closed, and it's simple enough, you can talk about some part of space being inside and some part of space being outside, so you can talk about the exterior normal. So I picked the exterior normal. That's a standard choice when it comes to, more common choice when it comes to closed surfaces. So we will be discussing the basis, we will discuss the covariant basis B alpha beta with respect to the exterior normal. So once again, you always have to specify your choice of normal when you talk about the curvature test. So we'll choose the exterior normal. So let's remind, let me remind you of the definition we're using. We'll be using this definition. Not so much a definition, this formula. Time of the normal. Oops. And remember, because the normal is an invariant, the covariant derivative is simply the partial derivative. So all we have to evaluate is the rate is the direct rate of change of the normal with respect to each one of the variables. So let's write that explicitly here. 
that it's the part simply the partial derivative. The covariant derivative coincides with the partial derivative for invariance, or any tensors, or any variance of order zero. So it's D normal, D S. I actually forgot to mention that this formula is called uh, V and Garden's formula. I won't attempt spelling it, but you can certainly find it in the book or anywhere on the internet. So I would say any formula that involves the covariant derivative of the normal, that in one way or another expresses the covariant derivative of the normal, should be called V and Garden's formula. Okay, so let's now focus on this. So the answer will go over here. And of course, once we obtain this answer, it'll be most intriguing to raise one of these indices, find the expression for the curvature tensor with one upper and one lower index, and then find the trace, which will be mean curvature. Okay, so let's talk about this. So we'll first, so here's our, so in order to figure out these four values, this here will be our strategy. We'll, we'll first pick theta, then phi, and for theta, we need to evaluate this derivative as a vector, and then mentally dot each one, and then mentally dot that vector with each of the basis vectors, covariant basis vectors that I have drawn over there. Okay, so let's think about n as it changes as a function of theta. Well, of course, here is the vector n as a function of theta. It's just the unit vector, a unit vector rotating and making a full revolution in two pi units, or half a revolution in this case, in pi units. So we've encountered the situation many times before, most recently five minutes ago. So we know that what this, how to describe the vector that represents its derivative with respect to this transformation, with respect to that change. It'll be a unit vector, because we have a unit vector rotating making one full revolution is in two pi units. It'll be a unit vector in the normal direction. So it'll point in the exact same direction as S1. And it'll be length one. So when we dot that vector, so this is these two entries. Excuse me, let's think of this as the second index. That's right. Uh, this, if beta is the second index, beta changes in this direction, so alpha changes in this direction, so it's these two, it's these two entries. And what do we have? We have a normal vector, excuse me, we have a unit vector that points in this direction. So when we dot it with S1, unit vector dotted with a vector that points in the same direction of length R, the result is R. And when we dot it with S2, well of course it's orthogonal to S2 because it's parallel to S1, we get zero. Okay, so that was the easy part. Now let's talk about the hard part, which is the rate of change of this vector with respect to phi. So it's going around the Earth this way. So let's, let's try and visualize it. So it's a vector, so if you imagine a circle right here, and here's the normal, it's a vector that changes like this, it keeps pointing, it keeps pointing outward. And so we haven't encountered this situation before yet. So here's what I would suggest. Let's decompose the normal in two components. The vertical component and the horizontal component. So let me just make a statement about the vertical component. The vertical component is constant. It would be a vector like this. And its length is, so we're decomposing it into a vertical component and a horizontal component. All right. So the vertical component is length cosine theta, because this angle right here is clearly also theta. This angle is pi over 2 minus theta. All right, so that's the geometric picture. So as it keeps rotating, 
I'm not doing a good job pointing in the exact right direction, but hopefully you get the idea. So the vertical component doesn't change. And of course the horizontal component, which is length r, so that was r cosine theta, so this is r sine theta, r sine theta, rotates at constant rate and makes a full revolution in 2 pi units. So we exactly know what the derivative of that component looks like. The derivative of that component will also point in the normal direction, normal direction to this vector. So it will point in the exact same direction as S2, and its length will be r sine theta. r, its length will be, excuse me, Yes, I knew something was wrong. As I'm mentally checking the units, because n is a unit vector, of course it's just length sine theta, not r sine theta. Sine theta. <clears throat> so we have a vector of length sine theta making a full revolution in 2 pi units. We're familiar with that situation, so the derivative will be orthog in, of course in the plane of the circle, orthogonal to this vector, and its length will be sine theta. So it points at all points in the direction of S2. It's collinear with S2, and its length is sine theta. So it's orthogonal to S1, delivering a zero in this entry, and its length is sine theta, so when we dot it with a vector of length r sine theta, we end up with a vector of length r sine squared theta. And there you have it. Not so hard. This is the covariant curvature tensor. And I just want to look at I just want I just wanted to look at tiny bit nicer just because it's such a fundamental object. So Okay. Okay, great. So, of course, this does not allow us to calculate mean curvature, because in order to calculate the mean curvature, we have to have a, a form of the curvature tensor with one index raised. That's not so hard, because B alpha theta equals S alpha gamma B gamma beta. So of course it's simply the matrix product of this, of this object with this object. Nothing could be easier. Let's see. So let's just, what can I erase? I don't think I need to erase anything. I'll just move this beautiful sculpture, and put it in this corner. So we have the alpha beta. So before I write it, I just want to say that when we're talking about mean curvature, some invariant on the surface, it should be the same at all points on the surface. It's a, sur it's a sphere. All points are exactly the same. So we're talking about an, in it's an invariant, a geometric invariant, it has to be the same at all points in space. So of course our coordinate system chose a very special orientation. It was arbitrary where we chose the North Pole to be and the South Pole. So that, that was completely arbitrary. Because we chose a coordinate system, many of the intermediate calculations of which this is one and this is one, and actually all of them until we get to an invariant, have a lot to do with the coordinate system. It's just that the covariant derivative in the entire tensor framework has that wonderful property that these objects still have a, a ready-to-go recipe for getting back to the invariants. And we're about to get back to one of the invariants. So of course, uh, that invariant, because it's characteristic of the surface itself and not the coordinate system with which you chose to work, should be independent of coordinates. So it's a long-winded way of saying that mean curvature should really be independent of theta. This form of the, of the curvature tensor is not independent of theta, 
But by the time you get to the invariant, theta should go away, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Uh, let's see. Forgot this minus sign everywhere. So minus, very important, minus. That's correct. Okay, so equals, well, you can tell what it is. Minus 1 over r and minus 1 over r. Not good enough. So minus 1 over r and minus 1 over r. Okay. So that's the curvature tensor with one upper and one lower indices. And now we're ready to calculate the mean curvature. B alpha alpha, which of course is B11 plus B22 minus 2 over R. So, the mean curvature of a sphere of radius R is minus 2 over R. With respect to the exterior normal, so that's an important thing to remember. If you look up the mean curvature on the sphere and you see the expression that says 2 over R without the minus sign, that's also correct. But that just means that the normal was chosen to be the interior normal. With respect to the exterior normal, it, it's minus 2 over r. It's negative. So when the surface is convex, and you're calculating the mean curvature with respect to the exterior normal, it is negative, something to keep in mind. Also, this 2 is interesting. So or perhaps originally mean curvature was defined as really the average well, that's a little premature to say the average of what. I'll say it in a moment. Uh, so according to some definitions, mean curvature has a factor of one half. And if we went to the end dimensional space, it would have a factor of one over n. One over n dimensional manifold. There would be a factor of one over n in some definitions. We don't use that factor. And we just calculate the trace. So it's just a convention. So according to the convention I used in the book, there is no factor in the definition of mean curve, of the mean curvature. Okay, so minus 2 over r. Let's talk about pause for dramatic effect. It's sort of a very, it is a very nice moment when we've established, we have so far established a very important concept of curvature, the covariant derivative, we'll put it all together, and all of the all of the concepts, and we've calculated a very important geometric characteristic of a surface, or a particular surface. So this also showcases the property of tensor calculus, that all expressions, all expressions have a computational recipe embedded in them. You can turn in any definition with lots of indices, and their arrangement and their placement is just a very robust and effective way of embedding the recipes for calculation. And we carried out one of these recipes right now and obtained an invariant, the mean curvature of the sphere of radius r. Okay, so now I want to say a few other things about the curvature tensor. So when you look at it in the form with one upper index and one lower index, there are a few other invariants associated with it. Whenever you look have a tensor with one upper and one lower index, it has as many invariants associated with it as the dimension of the space we're considering. In this case, the dimension is two, the dimension of the manifold. And those invariants in this case are, the trace is obviously one, but there's another one that's the determinant. Remember the determinant of a mixed, quote-unquote, mixed tensor like this is an invariant. So the determinant of this object is also an important invariant. It is denoted by a couple of different letters. The most common choice is K. I've recently started preferring just to use the letter B without any indices. 
to denote the determinant of this upper of this matrix. It is one over r squared, one over r squared, and it is called Gaussian curvature. It's called Gaussian curvature. Obviously, uh, just the name itself suggests its importance. It's an extraordinarily important object in its own right. We'll talk about this invariant at length as well in the future. At this point, I just want to mention that when you, again, once again, talking about matrices of this form, tensors of this form with one upper index, one lower index, that's for when we talk about the n-dimensional case rather than the two-dimensional case. This object in this form is symmetric, therefore all, but again, uh, I went back to that expression because I wanted to use the linear algebra term symmetric. Self-adjoint would be more appropriate here. This object may not be symmetric. In this case it is, but that's because of the special symmetries of the shape. But in general, this object is not necessarily represented by a symmetric matrix. Nevertheless, in a very precise sense, it is self-adjoint. Therefore, it has n real eigenvalues. Each of those eigenvalues can be treated as an invariant of its own. So in this case, this has two eigenvalues. They're very clearly, you can very clearly see them here. They're equal. So of course, then their sum and their product are invariants as well. And of course, you know from Lie algebra that the sum of the eigenvalues is the trace. So the sum of the eigenvalues here is minus 2 over r. It's the mean curvature. And the product of the eigenvalues is Gaussian curvature. So that's just another perspective on what those invariants are. But if you went, you went, if you went into higher dimensions, you might have three eigenvalues, four eigenvalues, not might have. You will have as many eigenvalues as there are is the number of dimensions. And the geometric multiplicity of those eigenvalues will necessarily match the algebraic code, the algebraic multiplicity of those eigenvalues, which has to do with this operator being self-adjoined. So I'm throwing out some of the terms that, you know, come straight from linear algebra and simply apply here, and I hesitate to do so because it's a little bit out of context, but just take my word for it that there will be n eigenvalues and n corresponding eigenvectors when you view this system as an operator. And all of those would be invariant. And I think the purpose of this long-winded presentation is to say that those eigenvalues have a name and a very great geometric interpretation, which we'll discuss in the future. They're called principal curvatures. The eigenvalues of this operator are called the principal curvatures and they have a fantastic geometric interpretation given by Gauss, given, uh, introduced by Euler, of course, but then given a lot of attention by Gauss. So that's why, that's where the term mean curvature came from, because perhaps the original definition was the average of the principal curvatures. We call it the sum of the principal curvatures, but if you talk about the average of the principal curvatures, that's where the coefficient of one half or 1 over n would come from to make it an average. So we consider the sum. And the product of the principal curvatures is another important invariant, which in two dimensions doesn't generalize to higher dimension, is called Gaussian, Gaussian curvature. And just one other statement, it's out of context now, but it will make sense later. Uh, Gaussian curvature has an alternative definition, more general than this one. And it actually only coincides with this one if, consistent with this one, if we consider surfaces in, embedded in Euclidean spaces. If we consider surfaces embedded in Riemannian spaces, in Riemann spaces, then the two definitions would diverge. But when for surfaces embedded in Euclidean spaces, the two definitions are equivalent. And just one last thing I want to mention, that these invariants called the principal curvatures are very important because you could define them when I said that they have a nice geometric interpretation. Well, they could actually be defined geometrically without introducing the coordinate system. It just seems like there are such obvious quantities, but it's all happened in retrospect. 
where you've built this entire framework of tensor calculus to be able to obtain these quantities easily. You see how, you know, within the span of one board, I was able to arrive at principal curvatures and mean curvature and Gaussian curvature and all the other quantities. It's just so easy because this network is so powerful. But of course, this framework was developed much, uh, much later, long after the concept of mean curvature and Gaussian curvature and principal curvatures were developed largely by geometric means, by very talented, brilliant, uh, really ingenious individuals such as Euler, Lagrange, Gauss, Riemann, and so forth. But the tensor calculus framework allows you to work with all of these quantities without possessing quite the same talent as those great individuals. Okay, so let's pause here and talk about something else next, not yet sure what it is. Thank you very much.